And here we are. Hello, insiders. How's everybody doing today? Welcome to uh, our, our live feed here on Facebook. Um, with me today, I've got Coach Dale Mattingly, and we are going to do a little deep dive on VA myth busting. So as you're coming in, uh, if you would, go ahead and sound off. Uh, let us know uh, who you are, where you served, and uh, when you served. Dale, you want to introduce yourself and let, let everybody know who you are? Yeah, good morning. Uh, 10, uh, excuse me, 9 a.m. Pacific time here. Happy to be here. I am Dale Mattingly. I'm a veteran coach here at VA Claims Insider. I'm a U.S. Marine Corps veteran, 100% permanent, totally disabled, and I'm here at your service. All right. And for those that, uh, that uh, don't know me, my name is Stacy Allen. Uh, I'm a U.S. Army veteran, uh, also 100% PNT, uh, go for vet. So thanks everybody for coming today. And again, go ahead and, and drop your comments in. Let us know uh, where you're calling in from. And we will uh, get started here on our, on our topic today, uh, myth busting. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Larry, so, uh, welcome. Welcome, Joshua, Josh Rogers, welcome, Army, Ua. Frank Britt, welcome, Air Force, Rob Nichols, what's Rock up? Rockstar Rob. What's Rock up? Rockstar Rob. Larry Hauser, 81 to 04. What branch, Larry? Awesome. Kevin Sanders, Army vet. Kevin, I think we caught you this morning on the uh, coffee with the coaches. Nice, nice job there. Thanks for your service, everybody. Thanks for being here. Cool. So we got Kevin McGuire posting up here from the Navy, anchors away. So while everybody's getting getting situated here, uh, why this topic? Why the myth busting topic? Um, well, frankly, there's there's a lot of information out there that that people think is true, but it's not. Okay, or or things that that are true, but they think it's not. So we're gonna we're gonna touch on a few topics today and uh, and kind of dispel some of those myths. Yeah, absolutely, Stacey, you're right on. And, and you know, a lot of times, uh, one of the most popular questions that we hear about, and you may agree with this, is, uh, you know, topic number one is, if you have a mental health rating, is that gonna put your uh, gun ownership and Second Amendment rights at risk? And, and that answer is unequivocally no, uh, in most cases. Uh, you know, Stacey, maybe you can share on this. I have a lot of, uh, I have a short, period of time in law enforcement. Uh, when I was younger, you have more recent experience with that. Um, and, you know, owning a weapon, you know, and, and, and as a civilian and also um, being in law enforcement, uh, you know, really the only way that you're going to have restrictions is if you're a harm to yourself or others. Isn't that right, Stacey? That is absolutely right. So, so there are, you know, there are some situations if, if the court has found someone incompetent, and usually that that involves, you know, court orders. Uh, that that in and of itself may put your uh, Second Amendment rights, you know, in jeopardy. But not not gun ownership itself, simply because you have a mental health rating or a mental health diagnosis, as far as that goes. All right, so. Um, but that is one of the things that we hear a lot. You know, I, I don't want to file. I know I've got some mental health issues, but I'm not going to file for it. The government doesn't need to know that because I don't want them to take my guns away. Um, so I, I'll tell you, I'm I'm 70 percent rated for PTSD. Same here. Um, I have a. Uh, I have guns all over my house, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And, right. And, and I have a concealed carry permit. Uh, and, and we're going to get into a, to another myth here in just a little bit that I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit. But absolutely, it will not affect your your right to uh, uh, to own your own your own, own your weapons. Yeah, that definitely shouldn't prevent you from from pursuing a mental health claim for disability. I have a seventy percent rating as well. I have a plethora of things wrapped into that. Uh, mental health uh, diagnosis, uh, which your coach will get into with you when you sign up as an elite member with the, with the company. Uh, but uh, no, and I have lots of weapons. I'll just leave it at that. So, uh, <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, to your point, that, that definitely hasn't put uh, my rights or your rights in jeopardy, and we're at 70%. So. Yeah, and, and you know, I think for, for a lot of veterans, you know, a lot of veterans like their weapons, like their guns, right? So. Uh, that is a big deal to a lot of us. So, absolutely. Um, 
So if you have any questions on that topic, uh, feel free to throw them up there. Um, we'll, we'll try to answer any specifics that come up uh, as we're going through this. Don't feel that you need to hold your questions till the end. I'd like to make this is a, as informal uh, you know, as possible, more of a conversation. So if you have some questions, go ahead and toss them over there in the chat and we will try to get to them. Uh, thank everybody for being here. We have got a lot of people in the in the chat already if you haven't sounded off yet go ahead and go ahead and jump yourself in there and let us know where you're at and uh branch that you served years that you served love to hear from you awesome yeah so we we got started here with uh with topic number one stacy you know mental health rating and gun ownership uh great topic hopefully we answered some of those questions and and sort of assuage some of those concerns related to that topic um you know, and, and then you also take a look at maybe uh, topic number two. And of course, you know, with topic number two, you know, if you're working uh, with a mental health rating that you can't work in law enforcement, and, and that's just not true. You want to talk about that a little bit, Stacy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Dale and I were, were just uh, talking right before we went live here, and, and I learned a little bit about uh, Dale. He actually worked in law enforcement in his younger years, and I think he's still in his younger years compared to me, right? Mm -hmm. But... <laughs> Um, but, but I too, uh, worked in law, law enforcement, 26 years, uh, federal law enforcement. And I retired a few years ago and I did have, uh, a PTSD rating during that, during my time, uh, in my employment there, it, it has absolutely no bearing, um, on, on, on working in law enforcement. Uh, think about this. Uh, I, I would say a very high percentage of our law enforcement community across uh, the U.S., you know, local, regional, county, state, uh, federal, are former military, right? Yeah, they are, right. They are, and, and, and a lot of former military have, have some mental health issues. There's no doubt about that. Um, so if you think that a mental health diagnosis or a mental health rating will affect your your um, employment and law enforcement you're just mistaken it absolutely will not so yeah and and you know according to the u.s census data there's about about 20 percent of law enforcement are veterans i would have thought that number was a little higher stacy but uh you know uh lots of people get out i have i have a couple friends uh or former friends i haven't talked to them a heck of a long time but a couple people that work for lapd and other metropolitan police departments around the country uh, sheriff departments uh, so they vary a lot of those people in ratings, some of mental health ratings between 30 and 70%. Uh, I don't know uh, too many veterans that have hundred uh, percent mental health rating that work in the field, but I, but I know of a couple and, you know, as long as you can, uh, you know, meet your employer standards, uh, typically that's, that's not an issue either. And also seeking treatment, right, Stacy? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Absolutely right, Dale. Yeah. Um, so before we before we move on, I want to take just a second and, and recognize someone that works in the background here uh, every Wednesday. Every time we go live, uh, Eric, the bearded vet, he is uh, man, he is just awesome. So, Eric, thank you for for doing what you're doing. So, for those of you that don't know, he's working in the background in the studio here, making sure that that things are running smooth and and things are on time and and that your questions are getting popped up. Anytime you see these little pop-ups, uh, that's that's Eric in the background making sure things are moving. So so thank you, brother. I appreciate what you do. Yeah, thank you, Eric. He makes it look easy. All right, Joe. Joe, how you doing, brother? So yeah, um, Joe went from zero to 70, Vietnam vet, man. This guy's <laughs> awesome. I love, I love <laughs> Joe, man. He's, he's on all of our calls, uh, so we do. You know, in the elite program, we have classes uh, every day and we have a we have a morning call that we do coffee with the coaches and Joe is there and and elbows deep in everything that they were doing. He took control of his claim and and man, he went zero to 70 like like a rocket. So congrats on that, Joe. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, absolutely. I also want to recognize Ricky Dowdy for the same reasons. Uh, ooh, rah, Ricky, U.S. Marine Corps veteran, 92, 96. Uh, Basically on the uh, chat there. Welcome, sir. Uh, always good to see you here. All right. So I um, saw a question to see. If you're denied PTSD, can you open another claim using the same info and more info? Okay. So that's a great question, Deborah. Thank you for that. So, yeah, you, what you would do actually is 
depending on on where your claim is, if it was denied, um, you can do what's called a supplemental claim by simply adding new and relevant information. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. New and relevant information. If you're if you're denied a condition, one of the con one of the things that you need to have in order to reopen that claim that you were previously denied for, like Stacy alluded to, is you have to have new and relevant information. Uh, it used to be new and material. So they lowered the standard a little bit there, but typically if you get with your coach when you sign up with our service and, and start, if you haven't started working on building medical evidence or, or looking at independent medical opinions, you can do that. And those things would be considered new evidence. And how do they sign up, Dale? Um, yeah, so we're gonna go, uh, there should be a link posted here today, but you can go to vaclaimsinsiderelite.com. Again, that's vaclaimsinsiderelite.com. And you're gonna get a response very quickly. Yeah, and, and so what what that elite program does, um, you'll be assigned a coach like uh, Dale or myself, and, and we'll just take you hand, you know, by the hand and, and walk you through the process. Um, you're not gonna be out there flopping around on your own. Um, I know this is, overwhelming for a lot of people to, to get into this business and start working on, on the claim process. But I'll tell you, uh, VA Claims Insider has this down to a science. We have a process in place and and uh, and it works. Uh, I, I am a former client uh, before I became a coach and, and through the process, uh, um, you know, VA Claims Insider helped me get to 100 percent PNT. So I can I can firsthand knowledge that the process works. Okay. Yeah, I got I got to 100 percent just before joining up here, Stacy. Um, I, I sort of ran into a few people and we talked and sort of wanted to bring some of my struggles and some of my wisdom to the table. I, I personally got denied six times on the way to 100 uh, percent. You know, you, you just got to be persistent in the process. Trust the process. Uh, the company has a very high success rate. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, we focus on education and we focus on teaching you what you need to be to do to be successful in the process. That's right. So, so in the chat and up on the screen there is is the sign up link vaclaimsinsider.com forward slash elite hyphen membership. Thank you, Eric. All right. So let's jump on to uh, myth topic number three. If you're working with your mental health rating, you must tell your employer. What do you think about that, Dale? Yeah, you, you don't have to tell your employer. Now, it's no secret. Uh, my employer knows I'm a disabled vet. <laughs> I mean, we all are basically. Not all of us. Some of us are not. But uh, we, we talk about that and that's um, pretty much common knowledge. But if you're working with your private sector employer, government employer, you're under no obligation uh, to disclose any of your disabilities or limitations. Uh, one, one, uh, one point you may wanna do though is if you're seeking an accommodation uh, you know, for your position, you may wanna discuss that privately with your employer if you need an accommodation. Like I get migraines really bad, I brought that up when I first started at the company. Sometimes I'm wearing sunglasses uh, during the day, sitting in my office. So uh, from time to time, I got to take a break and I just let my boss know about that. So uh, your case might be different. Right. So so mental health, just like any medical um, condition, is protected by HIPAA, right? Health Insurance Privacy and Portability Act, I believe is what that means or stands for. Some Something close to that. But it really involves about you know protecting your your health information. You're uh, yeah. like like Dale said, you're under no obligation to share that with your employer. Right. Okay. Well, especially with mental health. You know, I alluded yeah. to some migraine issues, but also with mental health. If you need some accommodations, if you need some breaks, you know, you're you're protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So there's a lot of federal protections in place for you uh, related to this issue for sure. Bill, I see your post, brother. 30% to 100%. That's amazing. Congratulations nice. on that. Nice. That's absolutely. I'll never forget the day I got there. I've been fighting for 20 years and I about fell over in my chair. It was, it was a great day. Congratulations, Bill. Yeah, that's an awesome feeling. So, hey, so I told you I was a client here, but I was actually a client while I was still a coach. When I found out I was 100%, I was actually on the phone with a client. And I'm walking them through um, VA.gov and how to how to get to their percentage. So I have I have another screen over here, over here. Mm -hmm. I have another screen over here. So I've got my my thing up, and I'm walking them through. Okay, now you go to this. Now you go to that. And I pulled mine up, and it said 100. 
And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. It's funny story, though, Stacey. I actually got my letter the day I started here last year. It was the same day I started here. That's amazing. So, um, you know, of course, my effective date went back a little bit further, but that sort of coincided with that. So I thought, man, this, this is uh, uh, really timely. <laughs> That's so, good stuff. Yeah. Kevin Myers, how can I get help? Again, VA Claims Insider Elite. Dot com sign up Absolutely. one of us there you go there's the link just click on that link and we will get you started today okay you'll be assigned a coach today we'll reach out to you and we'll get you moving forward in this process absolutely absolutely okay so i'm seeing a lot of questions over there in chat um i'd like to take a pause on our on our topics for a minute and see if we mm -hmm. can't get to some of those questions dale you want to hit eric. this one? yeah eric eric reed welcome welcome um, so applied for PTSD, was denied, but was granted non-service connected depression. How can I get that converted to uh, service connection? So Eric, you know, there's, there's 31 rateable uh, mental health conditions. Okay. And if you're rated for depression, uh, PTSD, basically I got rated for depression too. Uh, you know, I have PTSD and other conditions wrapped in and due to pyramiding, you can only be compensated for one mental health, uh, condition but you can have, you know, individual um, diagnoses, if that makes sense. So they all pay the same and they all have the same symptoms on the rating schedule, 38 CFR 4.130, which your coach will talk about. So i um, glad you were granted depression. Uh, if you want to get your, your PTSD, uh, you know, wrapped in there with your mental health rating, just continue to seek treatment um, at the VA or outside the VA. So I, I, I want to just touch a little bit more on Eric's question because I think I read something a little bit different. Um, so you applied for PTSD. It was denied, but you said you were granted non-service connected depression. So what I'm what I'm oh, okay. pulling out of that is that you actually got a diagnosis of depression, but they found it non-service connected. So okay, I must have misread that. Much. Yeah, no, that's that's fine. That's why I just wanted to reach back to this. So. Uh, I want to just make a general statement here on on service connection. So there's actually three things, three things that you have to prove in order to get a service connection. And that's not just for mental health, but for any condition. OK, you have to have a uh, an in-service event, OK, in-service condition, either seen or treated for it or something happened to you uh, while you were on active duty. You have to have a current diagnosis, usually within the last 12 months or so. And you have to have a nexus. You have to have, a, and a nexus simply is a doctor's opinion or a medical professional's opinion saying that your current diagnosis was at least as likely as not caused by that in-service event that happened. Okay. Yeah. So if any of those three things are missing, you're going to get non-service connected. It's not going to happen. Okay, so you have to hit all three. And that's where that's what we do as coaches. We make sure that you're that you're in the best position uh, with all three of those things uh, in your claim packet to make sure that, you you know, you have the best chance at winning your claim. Yeah, that's a great point, Stacey. And uh, I just want to circle back to Eric's uh, question or comment as well. Um, you know, and, and that would be a different answer based on interpreting the question properly. But, you know, when you get with your coach, you're going to have to, like I said, you know, establish all three of those elements. And typically it's a nexus issue, right, Stacy? Um, you know, you're going to probably need to look at an independent medical opinion or a nexus letter to uh, to bolster your claim, you know, to establish all three of those. Right. Yeah, that's you're exactly right. That's that's where most veterans fall down is that nexus. I mean, you know, we, we hear it every day. Well, well, the VA diagnosed me with sleep apnea. You know, why can't I get that service connected? Well, there's a couple other things that that you have to show. You have to show that in service event or connection and, and, and that nexus. Right? That's a great point. Yeah. I mean, PTA, excuse me, um, OSA, obstructive sleep apnea is the most denied condition, uh, you know, in the VA. And you can talk to your coach individually about that. Uh, but yeah, nexus is are, are most most commonly, you know, the issue that's missing. Ron, I see your uh, I see your uh, your post over there. Um, got seventy percent in two months. Congratulations! And um, 
in five days, you've got a hundred percent P and T. That is amazing. Wow. That is amazing, brother. Congratulations on that. Wow, Ron D man, taking them to the woodshed. Nice work. Okay. Norman, how does an increase work? So an increase, if, if you're already service connected for a condition and you feel that it's a low ball rating, um, you simply apply for an increase. Now, depending on what that condition is, uh, is probably going to determine the evidence that you need uh, to support that increase. Okay. And that may be an independent medical opinion. It may be as simple as a, a statement from you, a statement in support of claim. Okay. To say, Hey, you know, my knee hurts more than it did, you know, 20 years ago. I'd like to be reevaluated. And that might be all you need uh, to apply for that increase. But uh, I would get with your coach and, um, you know, uh, put your best strategy forward on, on cases like that. All right. All right. I want to um, take a so, look at, I'm sorry. So real, real quick, Dale, before you go on to another question. So uh, we got up here, uh, vacifree30.com. If you go to that, if you go to that website and you are not a member of VACI already, we will set you up with a free 30 minute strategy session with one of us, one of our coaches, and we'll go through, we'll go through your story and, and give you some ideas of best steps forward. Okay. So there's no obligation. Go ahead and go over to that website, fill in your information. You'll drop on a, a caseload of one of our coaches. We'll get with you and, and uh, give you some good ideas to move forward with your claim. Thank you for that, Eric. Absolutely. Yeah. I just want to jump over and uh, welcome Roman Herrera here. Um, Semper Fi uh, met you this morning at coffee with the coaches. I see it says I have 30% for anxiety at surgery. Stop taking my ven venlafaxine for the surgery. Sorry if I mispronounced that. My VA primary care physician has noticed that I had not ordered and stopped medication. Medication was really bad for me and I've been taking it for years. Having appointment, um, Will it reflect bad that I stopped taking the medication and should I have the prescription reactivated? You know, I mainly wanted to touch on your question, Roman, for one reason, and that is um, typically the average rating for mental health is 70 percent. And if your symptoms have worsened, um, I'm, we're not doctors, we're not um, claims agents. But what I can tell you is we know statistics. And if your symptoms are worse, 30 percent is a very low mental health rating. Typically, as you look at it, I see a lot of people and talk to a lot of veterans. Uh, so if those symptoms are worse, get with your coach and look at the rating schedule. And, and if, it, if, if they've worsened, then you should file a claim for an increase. Okay. So I wanted to address you there, Roman. Welcome. Thanks for being here. So in, in, in a general statement on medication, and I'm not a doctor either, but uh, everybody needs to understand that the, that the VBA, the, the, the Veterans Benefits Administration, and the VHA, the, Bene uh, the Veterans Health Administration, are really two separate entities under one umbrella of the VA. When it comes to treatment for your mental health or for any condition, uh, that's separate from, from compensation. And, and that should always come first. Okay, Your treatment should always come first. Your health means more than a couple dollars, right? So um, just keep that in mind. Um, take the medication if that's what your doctor recommends, if that's, if that's working for you. And understand this, that if the medication dulls your symptoms or helps you through uh, whatever you're going through, it's not a cure, okay? That does not necessarily mean that your symptoms have gotten better. You're just dealing with them better, right? So uh, just because you're taking medication your symptoms feel like they're getting better doesn't mean that they are. Okay. So for rating purposes, your symptoms, you know, may still be up here when the medication makes it feel like they're here. So keep that in mind. Great point. Great point. And Derek, uh, one more here, Derek, uh, what's the most common service connected disability I can connect migraines to Derek, you know, I can talk about my own case and other cases I see, and maybe Stacy could speak to this, but typically what I see is uh, tinnitus and mental health. Um, you know, Tinnitus can often cause or make worse migraine, so can mental health. But uh, talk to your provider about that. Uh, but that's a common uh, secondary to those conditions. All right. So we'll hit one more here before we go on to our next uh, uh, point on, on the myth. So Sheila's asking, is it true if you're 55, then once you get 100%, it will be PNT? Or what do you have to do to get PNT? So 
uh, that that's actually another myth that we can just dispel right. right now. So 55 is not a magic number. Okay. The VA does take into consideration your age uh, as, as one of the things that they consider when uh, awarding permanent and total status. Okay. Absolutely. 55 does seem to be a number um, that, that may take you over that line of P and T, but it's not a hard and fast rule. Okay, so there's other things that that's involved. Uh, what conditions you're service connected for, how yep. long you've been uh, diagnosed with that condition, and so on and so on and so on. There's a lot of things that's involved in that PNT. Now, as far as how do you get PNT if you're not, you can always uh, talk to your doctor or or talk to your coach. We can refer you to the med team that can review your case and and if it's appropriate write you a letter recommending PNT and you can use that to to uh, send into the VA and request that status. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, you know, I'm 47 years old. I got I got it at 46. Uh, you know, it age is has some it's a guideline basically, like Stacy said, but it really depends on whether your disabilities are static, which is what you can look at your ratings code sheet, get with your coach on that. And that's how you generally can tell if they're not going to improve or get better. All right. Great. So, okay, let's go on to the next one here. Myth, All right. myth number four. If you're rated at a hundred percent, you can't work. Busted. Yeah. Myth is busted. Okay. So there is a program called TDIU or total disability, individual unemployability. And that's where this myth generates from. So what that program is, if you meet certain criteria, and usually that means you're, you're rated somewhere between 60 and, and 90 percent, um, at, at, at 60 percent on one condition or a combination of two or more at 70. Um, you could uh, apply for that program, TDIU program. That doesn't change you to 100 percent. You still maintain that 60, 70, 80 or 90 percent, but you could get paid uh, at the 100 percent level. Now, with in that program, there are work restrictions. There's income uh, restrictions. Um, we typically do not recommend that program for our clients if we see a pathway uh, to a scheduler 100% for you. That's typically what we try to uh, guide our clients to because if you get the 100% scheduler, there's no restrictions. Right. And it typically comes with a lot of other benefits that's not available to those in the TDIU program. Yeah, Stacy, that's a great point. I mean, a lot of a lot of clients or, or several clients that I've worked with have pursued TDIU and been granted, but then you can still continue to work on that scheduler rating of 100%. So you're compensated at the 100% level and you can continue working with your coach uh, in, in getting that 100% scheduler rating. Uh, the TDIU program is kind of like social security disability for veterans in that it's not the same, it's different, but you do have uh, poverty level uh, restrictions on what you can earn unless you have um, a protected job, which is a whole nother conversation, but but that is a myth. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, let's hit a few more questions here. All right. So, so Roman, do you have to be 100%? I have 70%. However, it does not say PNT. Um, Roman, can you clarify that a little bit? I, uh, you don't have to be a hundred percent. You have, you can, you can apply, for, you can get TDIU, uh, if you're at 70%, uh, for one condition, but then you would need another service connected disability as well. Um, you'd have to have more than one. And then if, if you're asking Roman, if you're asking for permanent and total, um, so 70, you have to have a hundred percent to get permanent and total. That's, right. that's the T part of permanent and total. Total means a hundred, right? So that's why, if that's what you're asking, um, that's why you're not PNT. You have to have a hundred. Yeah. You can only be totally disabled once you're a hundred percent. All right. What else do we have over here? Sheila got 70%. Congratulations on that, Sheila. Yes. So Brandon, let's see here. Dennis Vincent, my tinnitus is the worst. I can hear it in my sleep. Tell me about it, man. My Everybody's is different. Mine sounds like a tuning fork. Like I'm a drummer, right? And it just sounds like somebody took one of those triangles and was going ding, 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 ding. You know, mm. so in some people it's hissing and some people it's buzzing. 
but talk to your uh, provider about how it sounds and the nature of it. So a lot of people, um, you know, tinnitus, if it's service connected, um, it's a 10% rating. There's no 0%, there's no 20%. It's 10% if you're connected, period. Um, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but really it's a strong baseline for a lot of other conditions that may be secondary, okay? Uh, more high value claims. So, so don't discount a tinnitus claim. Uh, a lot of people suffer from it. So if you're, if you're suffering from it, you should absolutely uh, get that connected. Yeah, I've had several clients, Stacy, go from 10 to 73 or 10 to 70 with a mental health rating. It can drive you nuts. It can drive you crazy. Yeah. Uh, it causes a lot of problems. Yeah. All right, Brandon, I'm at 90% and keep getting denied other issues. They just denied me temporary 100% after my third knee surgery. What am I doing wrong? I don't know that you're doing anything wrong, Brandon. Uh, here's, here's the hard and fast truth of it the VA don't always get it right. Mm -hmm. The VA don't always get it right. So my recommendation to you is if you're not an elite member already, jump on board, let a, let a coach review your files and see yeah. what we can do to do a deep dive into your case and, and get you over that hump. Yeah, Brandon. I mean, uh, the key is persistence, get with a coach, get with, get with a trusted advisor here. Uh, and they'll take a look at your situation. They'll do the VA math and find out if you're at 85% or 94%, which is a big difference, right? Yeah. Stacey? So yeah, we, they can take a look at that for you. So uh, on a decision letter I received, there was a note stating I would no longer be evaluated for the condition since permanence uh, had been established. Does this mean I'm permanent? What are the criteria for P and T? So, um, to answer the final part of your question there, the criteria for P&T is what we discussed a little bit earlier, is if, if you ask for a copy of your rating code sheet and your, all your disabilities are static and they're not going to improve, that is the most important thing. There's other guidelines like your age, uh, but typically that's the most important thing that they look at. If you have something in there that might improve, a condition that might improve, they, they often do this uh, with, with TBI injuries, I don't know why they think they're going to improve, but the VA seems to think that's the case. Uh, but that's the most important thing. Absolutely. And, uh, and on that too, James, um, so it sounds like you, you do have one, at least one condition that's been deemed static, like, like Dale was mentioning there, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're total. Now, if you are a hundred percent, and this goes for anybody, if you're a hundred percent and you're not sure if you're permanent and total, the easy way to find that out is go to va.gov, go to the letter generator down in the records block and print out your benefit summary letter. So remember that benefit summary letter, and that will tell you if you are permanent in total. Absolutely. And uh, Jeff Keller, I wanted to address Jeff Keller's question here. So Jeff, uh, yeah, zero percent for migraines did a history of headaches provided to C PCP now given meds. Should I ask for an increase? Still waiting on other claims. You know, you can get with your coach on that, Jeff. There might be a strategy there. Uh, but if you had zero percent for migraines, I sat there for 10 years and I was low. Ball, I had a low ball rating. And, you know, there's there's some conditions you need to meet in order to get an increase. Certain conditions in the rating schedule that you may not be addressing that you can get with your coach on. But that's typically when you see a lot of veterans at zero percent because they're not communicating their symptoms properly to to the VA. Uh, to be properly rated, but your coach can definitely help you out with that. All right. What else we got in there, Eric? Putting him on the spot. Absolutely. All right, Richard. Uh, so I have diabetes from Agent Orange, and the condition is not improved, and I have a and I have heart disease and mental health issues. Suggestion? Well, here's the suggestion. Eric's going to put up the sign-up link again. And my suggestion is to get on board, get yourself a coach, and let's get you moving forward, Richard. Let's make some stuff happen for you. There's the link. Click on that. Fill out the uh, intake form with some basic information. And we are off to the races. Uh, if you're not sure you want to sign up yet, feel free to jump over on the other link for a free strategy session. One of us will reach out to you and uh, we'll talk with you for half an hour or so. And there is that link. Thank you, Eric. Um, and, and, and 
we'll just do a deep dive into what you got going on and see what we can do to help you. Appreciate the question. Stacy, you want me to jump up myth number five here? Let's uh, go ahead and answer Bradley there. And oh, then, there we go. Yeah, then feel free. Cool. Bradley, a little off topic from PTSD. I have a huge scar on my left arm, which is 10% service connected. I have major arthritis and limited range of motion. Our pain increases still a thing. So, you know, when we talk about pain, you can get with your coach more in depth on this, but typically chronic pain can be addressed under what's called a lifestyle impact claim. And you can get into your coach with that. And that is a high value claim. It's classified as a mental health condition, but uh, there's some been, been some rulings in the last few years that are favorable to veterans on this matter. So definitely talk with a coach Bradley uh, on that. And uh, I think you have something there for sure. So uh, myth number five, moving right along here, earning and working with 100% VA disability rating. You're not restricted once you get a scheduler 100% rating. All right, Stacy. That uh, is absolutely correct. Yeah. You know, we both work full time here, sometimes overtime. Uh, I know <laughs> Stacy puts in a lot of hours. He's like a machine. <laughs> so just trying to keep up with him. But um, you can you can definitely be productive, work full time and get you know, whatever your compensation is, whether it's, you know, 30,000, 60, 100, whatever it is, you know, like you can make a million dollars if you want to. Um, you're just being compensated for your disabilities related to your military service. Uh, so outside of TDIU, yeah, you can you can do whatever you want to do. That's a myth. Yeah, absolutely. So so just like Dale said, you're being compensated for your injuries. This is not a handout, right? This has nothing to do with your income. This has nothing to this is this is uh, something that you earned, right? So you were injured uh, in the line of duty, and, and this is compensation for that injury. Keep that in mind. That right. this is not this is not a government handout for you. This is something that you earn. Yeah, it's like it's, it's supplemental income for you uh, based on you know the events that happened in your life, and uh, you know it's not a it's not a it's not there to hold you back in any way. Okay, uh, David uh, is asking, if I get retired payment and I go over 50% disability, will I get separate checks? I don't know if it comes from, uh, you know, two separate deposits or two separate checks, but uh, you will get, um, once, once you hit that 50% threshold, instead of them combining your retirement and that uh, uh, compensation that you would receive up to 40%, now you get the full 50% uh, or higher compensation so yeah when you're up yeah when you're up to 40 zero uh 10 to 40 then they they do deduct that portion but once you hit 50 then you'll get uh you'll get paid in full for both of those 50 and higher plus your retirement all right larry is asking for the free link again for the um free strat session so if we could throw that up just one more time there you go larry so grab that jump on there fill out that intake form and you'll hook up with one of us okay all right um so let's talk about topic number six that we had discussed dale uh so you have to be diagnosed with your condition during active duty to receive va benefits is that, that right is, that absolutely. is absolutely a myth um, absolutely okay. you know I, I didn't file for anything until about 13 years later, got out with a 10% shoulder injury, uh, you know, then tinnitus, then migraines, then, then other things. And, and, and how you do that is uh, you have secondary service connection available. You have five different ways that you can establish service connection, Stacy, right? You got direct service connection tied to your military service. You got secondary service connection. You also have aggravated pre-existing conditions that you may have had. Uh, you've also got a presumptive uh, service connection. Uh, and you've also got malpractice by the VA, which is more rare, but it, but it does happen. Right. So Dale, I'm in the same boat as you. Um, so I was, I was out of the army for 24 years before I filed my first claim. And so I was actually in a medical unit. Um, so guess what happens to everybody that's in a medical unit? We just treat each other, yep. right? <laughs> There's no document. It's like, Hey doc, can you cut this out for me? Yeah, sure. Cut it out. There's no documentation. Spit so, it, right? so, you know, when I'm ready to file, all I have is my DD-214 and my MEPS intake uh, physical. That was, that was the extent of my 
my uh, military service treatment records, my MEPS intake physical. Um, so like Dale said, you know, when you, when you start working on uh, presumptive conditions, and that was uh, one of my first claims, a presumptive condition from the Gulf War, and then you just build on it from there with secondaries and then mm -hmm. uh, so on and so on and so on. So there's, there's always a pathway. If you're suffering from, you know, specific conditions that can be connected to your active duty service or to another service connected disability, we can make it happen. Right. Yeah. And you must have a diagnosis. Uh, I got denied probably four or five times because I had a condition and I assumed, well, I have it and I'm suffering from it. So the VA is going to pay me. It doesn't work that way. And your coach will expound on that a little bit for you. But if you just follow uh, the process, uh, you know, build that medical evidence, have the proper diagnosis, have the proper nexus uh, in one of those five ways we mentioned. Good. All right. So Alfie Martinez, just want to throw that up there real quick. Alfie says that I'm great. Hi, Alfie. <laughs> You got all types of people promoting yeah. man. coffee with the coaches here. Yeah. Love it, brother. So what other questions do we got? There Curtis. You go. Yeah, Curtis. Hey, welcome, Curtis. He has, he's always got those awesome hats on, like whenever we see him in the meetings, man. Welcome, Curtis. So uh, thanks for your question. So at what point is pyramid considered when rated condition leads to other issues that result in permanent damage to other organs, which issues – that can be related, rated separately, uh, CKD, stage 3P with a multitude of other diagnosed problems, cardiomyopathy, hypertension, PTSD. Curtis, I believe you're a medical professional. Uh, this is a little bit out of my wheelhouse here. Um, and I wanna make sure that, that we can answer your questions, but, but pyramiding typically um, is when you can, you can only be compensated for one condition. You can have multiple diagnoses, you can be rated for conditions, but you can only be compensated for one in that category. Good example is mental health, like we talked about, right, Stacy? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so like Dale said earlier, there's 31 symptoms uh, that the VA recognizes as comp compensable mental health symptoms. Now, there's probably well over a hundred different mental health diagnoses, but they all share those same 31 symptoms at, at some level. So the VA will rate you on those symptoms and not the diagnosis. Okay. Same thing like uh, headaches, for instance, say, say you get rated for headaches and you've had a TBI that causes headaches. Okay. So you're not going to get rated for both if the TBI is only causing headaches right. because it's the same thing, right? Even though it, it may be caused by two different things, you're getting rated for headaches. So pyramiding would be getting rated for both of those. They don't allow that. So those would be combined. Yeah, they do this a lot of times with with uh, uh, GERD, as it's called, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and irritable bowel syndrome. They sometimes will combine those into one rating. Great questions today. Absolutely. Love it. All right, Rick. Uh, hey guys, I have a niece who is on with us right now. Hello, niece. Um, and she is in the service right now. What advice would you give to people who are currently on active duty? You hear Brian Reese say this all the time, get your butt to the doctor, right? So a lot of us, um, we don't go to sick call, you know, especially some of the older vets like myself, you know, we were taught just to rub some dirt in it and keep going. But you have got to get to the doctor and get get those issues documented. That makes for a clean claim once you once you leave service. It's easy. And if you file within a year of, of leaving service, most of those things will be presumptive conditions. So you don't even need that nexus. Okay. So uh, great question, Rick. So if you are on and you're in the service now, you're dealing with any issues, make sure you get to the doctor and get that stuff documented. Absolutely. For sure. So I'm going to jump on Mike Angerstein here. Uh, hey, Michael, welcome. Can I claim somatic symptom disorder secondary to tinnitus? So first of all, somatic symptom disorder is in the DSM-5. It's a, it's a psychological condition, and it's related to chronic pain. So you can get with your coach on building a good strategy there, but you should be able to do that uh, if it causes uh, you know, a lifestyle impact to you and chronic pain. But yeah, get with your coach and talk about the, the proper strategy and the way to file for that. Yeah, but I think you have something there. Yeah, absolutely. And again, for, for everybody, you have to have a current diagnosis. 
that's that's one of the key things. That's one of the three key things that you need. So if you don't have that diagnosis, you can't file for that. Or you can, but you're going to lose. Okay, so make sure that you have all that stuff in order. You bet, Mike. Thanks for your question. All right, other questions. Here we go. What is the average rating for GERD? So GERD can be rated at 0, 10, 30, 60. Yep. Right? We typically see 10 and 30. Yeah, and mostly it, 10. It, <laughs> I'm sorry? Well, mostly 10. They, they slap, mostly 10. They slap that yeah. low ball rating out there and kind of make you fight for anything higher than that. Right. Yeah. Right. So your symptoms have got to be, you know, fairly severe um, with some chest pain or maybe arm, shoulder, kind of like maybe feeling like a heart attack. If you're if you're having those kind of symptoms right. along with the regurgitation and, and they use all those fancy words, right? Facey dysphagia, dysphagia <laughs> difficulty swallowing, pyrosis, acid right. coming up, but substernal arm and chest pain. But but where people fall short on the 30, Stacy, a lot of times is is considerable impairment on their life. Mm -hmm. um, so get with your coach on that and how to put that in your statement the right way. But you have to talk about the impairment on your life. If you don't do that, then then you end up underrated for that condition. Thanks, Raymond. All right. What do we got? Um, Dale, did you have any other myths that you wanted to touch you know, on? I do. I wanted to touch on something that's really important. We're getting started with people here and, you know, bringing them aboard with us and, one of the biggest myth is, myths is that, that you don't deserve the disability pay. Okay. Mm. That, that's a myth. That's not true. You know, you served and you deserve. Uh, this is not a zero sum game. You're not taking money from someone else. Okay. If you serve and you have disabilities related to your active duty military service, whether you're a combat vet, you did, you served during peacetime and you got hurt during training operations, um, you know, get with your coach and take care of your, your own, you and your family's needs related to those conditions. That's, that's one I wanted to touch on. Man, and that is so important. And, and Dale, we hear this every day. And, and in fact, it, it was my own story. You know, I mentioned earlier, I was 24 years before I filed my first claim. And that was one of the big reasons because I didn't feel I deserved it. I, I came back with both my arms and both my legs and felt other, other veterans deserved it more than I did. So I, I held off on filing. I just didn't. You know, and it wasn't until I got older and things really started coming to the surface and really started uh, creating issues in my life. that I thought, OK, well, let me go ahead and and put this in. Um, but, man, we hear that every day from veterans coming in. I don't deserve this. I I, um, I don't want to take away from other veterans. Uh, yeah. But like Dale said, you're not. You know, the VA is funded several years uh, in front of us. You're not taking anything away from anybody else. Like you no. said, you served. If you were injured and if you have residuals from your service, then you definitely deserve to be compensated for that. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of guilt you deal with, too, um, Stacy. You know, like when I got out, I thought, man, I don't have my arms and leg, you know, legs blown off and I got all my fingers, you know, and I felt like I was I might be taken away from somebody else. But then, you know, you start to realize, you know, as I get older, these things are affecting me a lot more. So you should address them and you should also be compensated and get what you rightfully deserve under the law. And we'll help you do that. Absolutely. Uh, junior question on uh, OSA. What's a typical rating uh, for obstructive sleep apnea secondary to PTSD? Okay. So it doesn't matter what it's secondary to, or even if it is secondary. So the, the typical rating for obstructive sleep apnea is 30%. Uh, if it's causing you to be tired during the day, that's right. The, Daytime the, the hypersomnolence. Yeah. Yeah. The basis of it, hypersomnolence. Um, or if you're on uh, uh, some type of apparatus, uh, most commonly a, a CPAP machine, right. um, that's a 50% rating. Okay. So now let me talk about sleep apnea just briefly yeah, here. <laughs> that, that's it is. Uh, in years past, it, it may have been an easy claim to win. It's not anymore. Okay, no. it's not. Uh, the 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 Board of Veteran Appeals did uh, set a precedent with a decision they made last year, and and talking about how uh, uh, obesity could be used as an intermediate step between one condition and another. And we see those nexus, uh, and, and they do work sometimes, but the VA is inconsistent. On, on how they award these. Uh, I can send in two claims exactly the same and one will be 
connected and one won't be. We'll have to we'll have to keep fighting on that one that that's not connected. So just just be aware of that. That uh, sleep apnea is not a gimme. It's not a slam dunk case. But if you get on board with us, if you're not already and get a coach, we will definitely get a get a strong game plan and strategy in place for you and uh, and make some things happen. Yeah, there's some very important steps to follow with your coach. It's the most denied condition in the VA uh, disability process. So there's a lot of landmines, to use a metaphor, uh, you know, that you need to talk about with your coach for sure. So Junior, uh, let's see here. We had um, Ray Jackson. Thanks for your question, Raymond. So this was the one I wanted to answer. Does everyone get reevaluation? You can get reevaluated. I believe they say it's two years, five years, and 10 years. So if you don't have a static disability and you're not permanent in total, you're subject to reevaluation at those intervals. So once you hit 20 years, your condition is, is typically considered permanent and you're not subject to reevaluation. But typically you see it at two, five years, sometimes 10, but usually two and five. Yeah. Great question, Raymond. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Thanks, Cassie. Appreciate that. All right. We're coming up to the top of the hour. So if you've got some questions, get them over there in chat. Um, okay. Brenda's asking, a VA mental health therapist diagnosed me with uh, GAD. Can I get rated for this? Uh, but never discussed my diagnosis. Is this something I can get rated? So I want to make sure that I'm understanding the question. So first of all, the therapist uh, must be uh, a licensed you know, board certified practitioner, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, if, if they are a social worker or something like that, uh, the diagnosis is not going to uh, be accepted by, by the VA. Okay. So understand that, that, that you have to have a qualified medical provider giving that diagnosis. Yeah, absolutely. You can talk to people, you know, during treatment, but you want to make sure that the person typically is a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, you know, giving you that diagnosis. Okay. So um, is this something that you can get rated for? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. So remember the, the key is an in-service event. So if you had something that led to that anxiety, something that, that either happened to you or just, just part of the process of you being in the military eventually caused this anxiety that you're dealing with now, you have that current diagnosis of GAD and you have that nexus. Okay. So the nexus is the important part is connecting that current diagnosis back to your military. And that's how you get rated. Great question. Absolutely. And then Nia Scott also was talking, tying to that question. Do you have to be reevaluated for mental health? Uh, I believe that's your question. Uh, so you, yeah, you can be reevaluated for mental health once your service connected and have a rating for it. Normally, if you're going to treatment, uh, that's the key. You want to make sure that you're going to the to the VA and addressing any symptoms that you have. If you disappear for long periods of time, then they they are going to assume that you're getting better, which may not be the case. But you definitely want to uh, stay with seeking the treatment and at least doing your annual visits with your doctor. All right, Edward. If you have 100% disability outright. Can you get a CNP exam reevaluation if you're over age 55? So just like Dale was talking about earlier, uh, if you are if you don't have that permanent and total designation, yeah, you are subject to reevaluation. Okay, regardless of your age, age is only a, a part of the uh, consideration when when the VA awards uh, P and T status. So. Uh, again, if you're not sure if you have P and T or not, go into VA.gov, go to your letters and print out your benefit summary letter that will let you know. Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't have access to a computer, you can call 1-800-827-1000 and they'll tell you what your P and T date is that way as well. Uh, Tim, you want to take that trade? Yep. 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 So Tim's asking, um, my primary, my primary, uh, diagnosed me with depression some time ago. I'm finding that tinnitus is driving me nuts. Can depression be secondary to tinnitus? Absolutely. 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 Um, uh, and the key is, so you've got two of the three things that you need. You've got the in-service, which is the service-connected tinnitus. You've got the current diagnosis, which is the depression. Mm -hmm. Now you you need that, that nexus connecting the two together, and okay. then you are good to go. Okay, and that will have to be written by a qualified, certified 
board certified uh, medical practitioner, either a doctor, a PA, nurse practitioner. Okay. Absolutely. Got time for a few more questions, folks. Uh, we're coming up to uh, top of the hour. I'm glad everybody came to visit us today. Thank you, Edward. Appreciate the kind comments. Uh, so Alfie, yeah, well, that was, that's Eric read my mind, man. Pop that one right up there. Thank you. He's awesome, man. It's like, he's got this, you know, third sense or sixth sense. Excuse me. Will they ever call you back if you get P and T? Yeah, no, uh, typically not. Uh, there's some protections in place. Once you get permanent and total status, you're not subject to what are called routine future examinations. So normally once you get that classification and you're rating hundred percent permanent and total, you're typically not subject to uh, routine future examinations, Alfie. Yep. Now there is a caveat with that, and, and I've seen it happen, unfortunately. Possible if you where, file a claim. Where a, <laughs> where a veteran has a hundred percent P and T, and they decide, hey, I'm going to file another claim because this issue is bothering me. So uh, maybe they're rated for their left knee for ten percent. Now their right knee is bothering them. They're already hundred percent P and T. They file for that right knee. Well, guess what? That opens up your left knee for reevaluation. And if that is found to have improved, you may well lose your 100% PNT. So yeah. my advice always, if you're 100% PNT, enjoy the rest of your life. Don't be, don't be putting in any more. Yeah, don't let your uh, ego get in the way of uh, jeopardizing your rating. I tell yeah. my clients that, you know, if you're going to file a claim, make sure you file them before you get that classification. And the only way you should file a claim is if it's for a life threatening condition, uh, for if you have a spouse and so forth, but they can talk to you more about that, your coach. And uh, Derek, if you're being reevaluated for PTSD, if it has worsened, will they automatically increase it or would you have to appeal it? <clears throat> they can do that. Uh, they can increase it, but typically uh, they're going to evaluate you and leave it where it is or decrease you. So um, if your symptoms are worse, get with your coach and, and go over the rating schedule, go over your symptoms and just determine whether or not it's uh, worth uh, trying to make that move for an increase. The hardest jump is going from 70 to 100. Stacey will probably agree with that. Absolutely. Uh, I don't advise my clients to go for the 100% level unless they just have overwhelming evidence that they meet that standard. The two hardest claims to win are the first one, because that's when you're first getting started, right? That, that first 10% and that last 10%. Yep. I said I I, my, I I had a unlucky number ninety four. I sat there for a long time. <laughs> Same <laughs> here, like I, 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 drew, I sat there at ninety four, and I hated that. I hate that number now. Um, but you know, the, once you hit ninety five percent, that gets rounded up. And of course, if you're at eighty five, then you go to ninety. So getting from eighty five to hundred is the hardest jump. But sitting at ninety four, I felt like they drilled me on three claims in a row. I felt like someone was like, no, 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 no. But stay with your coach, stay with your persistence, and and, and follow the process, and um, and you'll get what you deserve. All right, so there was a question over in chat about the 31 mental health symptoms that I mentioned earlier. There is a place that we can, yeah, there you go, Nia. Um, if you are an elite member, uh, you have access to your Elite Experience Portal Plus, and there is a document in there that lists those 31 symptoms, those 31 conditions. So just jump in there um, and, and you'll be able to find it there. Uh, if you are not uh, a member uh, of VA Claims Insider, sign up and uh, we will get you access to that portal. There is a ton of resources in there. Um, you know, like Dale said, when we first started, we are an education based company. That's what we thrive on. Uh, we put you in the driver's seat to, to handle your claim. Right. We don't do it for you, but we we certainly teach you how to do it and 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 take control of your claim. No one should care more about it than you. Right. Yeah. You got to take the bull by the horns. You got to do the reading. You got to do the research. And some of my clients say I give them homework. I'm a certified teacher in the state of Arizona. So I can't, I'm just throwing out homework to my client, you know, but it works. You know, you read, you do the homework, you fill out your statements, you work with your coach and you'll be successful. Fantastic. And on that note, I think we're going to go ahead and um, uh, close shop today. Again, I appreciate everybody being here. Dale, thank you so much for partnering up with me today. My pleasure. Glad to be here, Stacy. And thank you to all the vets being here today. Thank you for your service to our country. 
and we'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great day. Y'all have a good day.